Hello and welcome to Stories from India, a podcast where we talk about myths, legends and folk tales from India. I am your host Narad Muni and I'm a mythological character myself. I have the gift of eternal life and knowledge of the past, the present and the future. By profession, I'm a traveling musician and a storyteller. So the way I'm doing my job is by podcast. In this episode, we are back into the Mahabharat. I had originally intended to continue the story of Satyavati and Bhishma and Ambika and Ambalika's problem of finding a successor. But I'll leave that for later. Let's continue the story of Amba, the princess of Kashi. who seems to have terrible luck if you have no idea what i'm talking about you could either check out links to the earlier episodes in the show notes or just hang on to your hats i'm going to give you a quick recap of the story so far shantanu ruled hastinapur in ancient india his son bhishma would have been emperor after him except the boy blew it all away just so that his daddy could marry a ferry operator named satyavati bhishma didn't just give up the throne he also promised never to marry or to have children if that sounded like a bad idea then it got terrible not long after because in just the space of a couple of episodes first shantanu then his two sons passed away leaving no heirs behind the only people left behind were bhishma and satyavati and satyavati's two daughters in law ambika and ambalika there was supposed to be a third daughter in law there because bhishma had abducted three princesses from kashi to be married to vichitravirya the crown prince of hastinapur that third princess was amba and this is her story amba stepped out of the palace in hastinapur she stood just outside the palace gates at a crossroads wondering where she should head next A nagging voice inside her spoke up. Maybe I should reminisce about some recent events, she thought. It's been almost 2 months since Nara did the previous Mahabharat episode. Some more details will help. So she recalled how only a month ago she was looking forward to domestic bliss as Mrs. Shalva at her swayamvar or groom reveal party. In one of the earliest instances of match fixing she and Shalva had agreed that she would choose him at the swayamvar but then Bhishma had upset the whole apple cart and he had also upset all the assembled royalty at the swayamvar he abducted Amba Ambika and Ambalika and took them back to Hastinapur after Bhishma learned about Amba and Shalva's engagement he sent her to Shalva but Shalva didn't accept her because in his patriarchal code of conduct he viewed Bhishma to have the sole rights to Amba Bhishma disagreed when Amba came back to him So the poor girl was treated like a ping pong ball. So that's the state she was in when she stepped outside the Hastinapur palace. She was at a crossroads, unsure where to go. Should she go back to Kashi, her father's kingdom? That was unappealing. Should she take another crack at Shalva? or just somewhere else entirely to clear her mind 
a group of rishis was passing by just then. They made casual conversation. When the rishis found that Amba had no food or shelter, they offered their homes. Now, an offer to take in a stranger into your home or the acceptance of such an offer by said stranger is definitely not something that will work in today's world. But in ancient India, it would have been considered rude if the rishis had not invited Amba. She went along with them and stayed not just that night, but a few more nights as well. It was exactly the break she needed, and she did clear her mind. She asked herself who was most responsible for her current situation. Was it Shalva, who rejected her despite their engagement? Was it her father? for arranging the swayamvar in the first place? Or was it she, herself, for not having escaped from Bhishma's chariot when he was distracted, temporarily, by Shalva and the other kings? But it was none of these. She firmly landed on the conclusion that the only person responsible was Bhishma. In abducting her from her swayamvar, and in rejecting her proposal at a time when she would have been okay to accept him as her husband. The next question, naturally, was what she should do about it. So she confided in the rishis. They did not express too strong an opinion on whether Bhishma should indeed be considered responsible. They lived in the Hastinapur jurisdiction, after all. But the rishis did suggest to her a course of action. Why don't you go back to your father, said one rishi. To the scene of the crime in Kashi? What for? asked Amba. My father and all his army couldn't lift a finger when Bhishma was on their turf. What could any of them do about it now? Wait a minute. You're the princess of Kashi? Asked one older rishi, who had just joined the group that day. Not little Amba by any chance? He asked. Amba stared at him for a moment. And then the realization hit her. Grandpa, she said because that's who that rishi was. It was Hotravahan, Amba's maternal grandfather, who had become a rishi. After the usual catch-up that you might expect from a grandparent and a grandchild who are meeting after several years, Hotravahan had a different suggestion than what the other rishis had offered. Don't go back to Kashi. I have a better idea. Do you know Parshuram? He asked Amba. Of course. Who doesn't? Asked Amba. He's an avatar of Vishnu and was featured on Narad Muni's podcast about a month ago. Well, not everyone listening to this may have heard that episode. So let me add by way of exposition that Parshuram has a short temper and he has sworn to destroy warriors all over the world. So go tell him your story, then watch the drama unfold. Thinking that this was sound advice, Amba proceeded to do exactly that. Amba and her grandpa made for Parshiram's place. They were greeted there by a polite rishi. Hi, I'm Akritvran. Parshiram is out at the moment. But your grievance slash prayer slash appeal is important to us. Would you like to make an appointment? The earliest I have is next week, he said, looking through a calendar. Well, I'm not sure I can wait that long, said Amba. An urgent case, eh? asked Akritran. 
Suppose you tell me everything and maybe I'll see if I can squeeze you in earlier. So Ambar did. And when she was done, Akrit Brand had a question. So what would you like Parshuram to help you with? Do you want him to talk to Shalva so that Shalva can marry you? Or do you want him to fight Bhishma for you? I'll take the fight with Bhishma option, please, said Amba. Akrit Vran nodded his head and agreed. He dispatched a message and within minutes, Parshiram himself appeared before them. Akrit Vran greeted his boss. It's a type 2C, sir. But here's an additional... Hmm, type 2C, said Parshiram, interrupting Akrit Vran. Payback for abducting a princess. Pass me my bow, Akrit. Lady, have no fear. I'll put your abductor on the extinct list faster than you can say Parshiram. Akrit, who is the perp? Bhishma, said Akrit. Bhishma? The Bhishma? Parshiram asked. He did this? But he's my student. He's made some poor choices, sir, said Akrit. If you recall, I had advised you back when he was studying not to give him an A-plus grade. Grades are not relevant to this issue right now, snapped back Parshiram. Give me some details here of what's happened. So Amba narrated everything all over again. Parshiram was sympathetic. Yes, princess, I agree completely. This is Bhishma's crime. I'll slay him for you. This is going to require some preparation and some specialized equipment. Akrit, give me the keys to the arsenal. So Parshiram went off to prepare to destroy Bhishma. A thought nagged him all the time. How could he destroy Bhishma when Bhishma had complete control over when and how he could die? Parshiram knew about the boon Bhishma had received from Shantanu. After a few days of preparation, Parshiram, armed with several weapons, made for Kurukshetra. He sent a message to Bhishma that he was waiting for him there. Bhishma did what any student would do when receiving a message from a teacher they had respected. He dropped everything and went straight to Kurukshetra to meet him. When Bhishma arrived, Parshiram was armed and ready with his first weapon, diplomacy. They exchanged pleasantries, after which Parshiram got straight to the point. I don't like what you have done here with Amba. This is the kind of thing that will give me a bad name. I'm sure people are whispering about how I am to blame for not teaching you well. We respect women, Bhishma. We don't abduct them from their homes. And if you do abduct them against their will... You have to be able to marry them against your will, if the lady chooses. I won't, sir. I can't, said Bhishma. I have made a promise to never marry, and I intend to keep it. With someone as short-tempered as Parshiram, they can only keep the effort at diplomacy going for so long, before they jump to the next step. Then I challenge you to a duel. Astra or Shastra, pick one, said Parshiram. If you're not familiar with the terms Astra and Shastra, Parshiram was asking if they should fight with projectile weapons or handheld weapons. I don't want to cross swords with you, my master, said Bhishma. Parshiram began pulling out his bow and readying his arrows, and said, Anything you say, Bhishma. Bhishma didn't want to fight his master at all. But now, 
he had no choice. He pulled out his bow as well, and a fierce battle began. They were very evenly matched. Every arrow that one fired was promptly struck down by the other. This goes to show that a teacher and a student really do understand each other's strengths and weaknesses very well. This went on for many days, with neither man able to even scratch the other. But the part that was not okay was the collateral damage from this fight, which got worse as they used more and more destructive weapons. First, a little fire here, a tree falling over there. But after a while, it was whole mountains getting crumbled and freak thunderstorms and lightning. On the 23rd day of this fight, just as both of them were readying yet another arrow in their bows, someone tried to intervene. It started as a trickle of water flowing between the two men, but soon it grew into a stream. Bhishma and Parshuram paused long enough to stare at each other. Is this one of yours? asked Parshuram. Not one of my arrows, if that's what you mean, replied Bhishma. But the stream is one of mine. My mother, Ganga. I'm going to call time out, he said, making the tea gesture universally recognized in the world of sports. And the stream was the Ganga. An extension of the Ganga, at least. She emerged from the water and asked her son, Bhishma, have you been trying to destroy the world again? No, Mama, I promise, said Bhishma. Then what are you doing here with Parshuram? And why did a whole mountain crumble and fall into me as I was flowing peacefully, minding my own business? I can't not fight him, Mama. He challenged me. That put a new light on the situation. So Ganga tried talking to Parshuram instead. But he wouldn't listen to her. Sorry, Ganga. I am not pulling out of this fight. I am on a mission and I am going to accomplish it. I don't really care about collateral damage. Besides, I don't want anyone saying that Parshuram pulled out of this fight because he was afraid to lose. Ganga knew how resolute Parshuram could be and decided not to take it further. But she did a really smart thing. She involved me. Yes, me. I bet you didn't see that one coming. But I'm Ganga's brother, if you recall earlier episodes, and I'm always willing to help. I'll add a word of caution here. Yes, I'm Ganga's brother, and that makes Bhishma my nephew. But on the other side was Parshuram, an avatar of Vishnu. And as I've mentioned in several previous episodes, I am Vishnu's number one fan. I could not play favorites here. But I had to step in. My knowledge of the future told me that there would be a cataclysm if I didn't intervene right now. As I stepped onto the battlefield, Parshiram said to me, rather gruffly, Go away, Narad. Go play with your Veena somewhere. The big boys are doing something important here. Parshuram, I said, we need to chat. You're doing the wrong thing here. I knew exactly what would work with Parshuram and what wouldn't. The collateral damage argument Ganga had tried was not going to work. I knew I had to appeal to his broader mission and his love for data. Think, Parshuram. Your time could be much better spent wiping out other criminals. If I look at your stats right now, 
you've gone 23 days without any success. Think what that will do to your strike rate. Parshuram was listening now. But I don't want to pull out of this fight. I want to destroy Bhishma. If I pull out, people will say I was afraid of losing. No one will say that, I said. I see the future. I am not just saying no one will say that. I know no one will say that. And I am not asking you to give up at all. I am just asking you to pause this while there are more urgent matters to deal with. Bhishma can wait as long as you need him to. The prince of Magadh stole from the royal treasury to have an ice cream party for his friends. I think that is way more important. You should go talk to him. This was the out that Parshuram had wanted. He was not keen on continuing the fight either. And I had given him the graceful exit he wanted. The idea had not come from him. It had come from an external source. Me. Ahoy, up there, I said, talking to the devs in heaven. Let's put this down in the records as a tied result. I then spoke to Bhishma and Parshiram. This was on Bhishma's home ground. The winner will be decided in the next round. Bhishma, the away leg for you will be on Parshiram's grounds. Since it's the final round, if that is a draw as well, we'll use the extra time, penalties and sudden death if needed. I'll referee. Date and time of the match are of your choice, Bhishma. So that's where they left it. Amba was devastated, of course. She had expected Parshuram to have wiped the floor with Bhishma. But instead, Parshuram said, Sorry, dear lady. I tried for over three weeks. Now, more urgent matters are calling me over to Magadh. Why don't you make peace with Bhishma instead? But that's one thing Amba could not do. Thank you, Parshuram. I'll deal with him myself, even if I have to come back from the dead to do it. She decided to seek her objective through prayer. She went to the Yamuna and stood still and prayed for six months straight, surviving only on the air that she breathed. She then stood on her toes for the next six months, but this time she had something to sustain her. A single fallen leaf. She did the same at a few other holy places, including at the Ganga. Ganga was not very pleased with Amba's prayers, since the objective of said prayers was to destroy her son. She cursed Amba. Amba would become a crooked river that would be infested with crocodiles, and that would be dry most of the year. To which, Amba's first reaction was, Oh no, how will the crocodile survive when I am dry? It did happen. There is a river in India called the Amba. But part of Amba continued to live on as a human and continued her prayers. Until finally, one day, Shiva the Destroyer appeared before her, which was exactly what she wanted since her objective was to destroy Bhishma. Shiva granted her wish. She would be reincarnated for the express purpose of destroying Bhishma. She would also retain her memories of her life as Amba. Having secured a path to Bhishma's destruction, Amba decided to hurry the process along by ending her life. Turns out, she need not have hurried. She had to wait a while before she could be born again as a child to the king Drupad of Panchala. 
will meet her again, but a little later in the Mahabharat. That's all I have for this time. Check out the show notes for links to the previous Mahabharat episodes. In the next episode, we are doing another Ramayana story. This one, by special listener request, is about Ram and Lakshman's sister. If you have comments or suggestions, or if there are particular stories you would like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or tweet at sfipodcast. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. Thanks to all of you listeners for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. I'll see you next time.